Right, so thank you. I, I'll say the same thing a lot of people have been saying. It's really been a great workshop and I really wish we could do this in person, so maybe we can at some point. Uh, so I'm going to talk about work that we've been doing for a while now in collaboration with uh, the group of Natalie Dostatny. She, she's an experimental geneticist who works on the fly. And I'll present some work done with her and Hui Tran. And then I'll move on to some more theoretical ideas that we worked on with Jonathan de Pont and Massimo Vercasol. All right, so I'm in the wrong thing. I'm going to be talking about part of flight development that's very early. Uh, and probably some of you have heard about this and are sort of sick to death of it and are wondering what new does she have to say about it. Uh, but, you know, hope, hopefully I'll convince you not everything has been worked out. So early in the fly, the fly mother, uh, the, in flight development, the fly mother lays down a bicoid uh, mRNA that then diffuses and are translated into proteins forming a bicoid protein gradient. So bicoid is a morphogen which has a decaying gradient as a function of the what's called the anterior posterior or AP axis, basically as a function of the body length. And bicoid is one of the early morphogens that then controls a bunch of other genes. Uh, and the first one that it starts to control early on is called hunchback. So hunchback is expressed in the first part of the embryo, so the anterior end, and is not expressed in the posterior. And as you can see, although the bicoid gradient decays exponentially, the hunchback boundary uh, is very sharp. So you get something very sharp from something not sharp at all. And so that, that is why physicists have been really intrigued by that. Uh, and, you know, and that's why we talk a lot about it. So you basically get this first part of the embryo where you express things and the second where you express from the hunchback gene and then the second one when you, when you don't. And you have this boundary zone or transition zone uh, in the middle. So uh, the, this has been quantified a lot and it turns out that uh, this process, this regulatory process is able to discriminate 10% differences in the input concentration, so in the Bicoy concentration. And why is that remarkable? Well, because 10% is not a lot if you're using a noisy molecular sensor to discriminate these differences. So people have looked a lot about at this at the, at the protein level uh, for hunchback. Uh, but more recently, we also have access into to mRNA data. And the question that intrigued us is if this boundary is so precise at the protein level, is the transcription boundary the result of transcription? So is the mRNA boundary equally precise? And this is sort of feeds into the more general questions of how do you make decisions, uh, how, how, how are decisions read out if you have a noisy sensor? So, you know, we've been hearing a lot about this yesterday and today, so hopefully I don't really have to motivate. It. But this sort of, you know, this is a real life developing system that goes into the same line of questions that uh, basically everybody today and some people yesterday talked about. And just because, you know, it's late and well tired, when people talk about this problem, they also talk about it as the French flag model. And this really confused me for ages because the French flag, to the best of my knowledge, and by now I think I should know, has three colors. And this hunchback boundary is sharp, so it looks like a flag boundary, but it only has two colors. So I think we should really either be talking about the Maltese flag because there's a source, or really what I want to talk about today is the Bahraini flag because I'm interested in this variability at the boundary. Okay, so what are the issues with, you know, why is this problem complicated? The first issue that makes it complicated is, that is the issue of time. So in development, you don't have a lot of time. Development happens fast. So in fact, from the moment that the Bitcoin gradient is established to the moment when we start having a precise transcriptional response, because I can tell you straight away that we do see a precise transcriptional response that I'll show later in more detail. 
it takes about 30 minutes. And the early cell cycles that make this readout, so transcription is closed, so there's no mRNA being produced in between the cell cycles, so there's periods of non-activity, these, but the totality of these cell cycles, so a cell cycle is when the number of nuclei uh, in the embryo divide, is very short. There's about five minutes. So you're making a readout in under five minutes and in a total integrated time of half an hour where a lot of time you actually are not making a readout, you go from have, being able to sense a gradient to actually sensing a precise uh, boundary. So the short message is that development happens in a short amount of time. So whatever brilliant algorithm you come up with, it better work fast. The second thing is this noisy readout. So why is there noisy readout? Again, I probably don't have to convince you about that because transcription is noisy. Uh, and so we have a measurement accuracy, meaning that we can distinguish bicoid concentration of the order of 10%. So that means that I can tell you that, that this cell here knows that there's a difference in the concentration of the bicoid gradient it's sensing compared to this cell here, and it can tell differences that are of order 10%. So what's 10%? That's a, if we have, as has been measured, of the order of 700 molecules at the boundary in the nucleus, that means that it can the cells can tell a difference of 70 molecules, and based on this difference of 70 molecules, decide on a completely different cell phase. Because I forgot to tell you that, that the reason that this hunchback gene is important is because it's one of the, you know, it's one of the stages of then deciding about the body pattern and then different cell phase. Um, so 700 molecules, again, may seem like a lot, but we're looking at the nucleus of uh, this uh, diameter, there's a certain diffusion. So the, the bicoid molecules have to find the binding site by diffusion. So it's not so certain that they'll do it. And from basic estimates based on the, the Bergen's Purcell estimate of a, of a basically sensory receptor, if you plug in these numbers, if you want to get 10% bicoid accuracy, that's going to take you about 40 minutes. And remember, I told you that this readout does happen in of the order of five minutes. So what's up? Um, and first of all, do we get, uh, do we, you know, do we actually get a sharp readout in short amounts of time? So here we turn to data from my collaborator, Natalie Dostatny, who uh, did live imaging in, uh, from the hunchback locus in early cell cycle. Also in cell cycle 11, 12, and 13. So she basically put MS2 MCP probes to onto um, the, the mRNA that gets uh, transcribed from the hunchback locus that's under that's regulated in the same way that the normal hunchback locus is. So she expresses both hunchback and she expresses these probes that then you tag. Uh, and light up. So you can basically see when expression happens. And uh, so these are chymographs, such as Aneta showed, so uh, as a function of the AP axis and time. So first of all, you see this period that I mentioned that there is no expression because things are turned off uh, between the, uh, well, between periods, uh, between the cell cycles, and then they get turned on. And you see in all cycles establishing of a boundary. So if we overlay these traces, you see that basically in, uh, in about 180 seconds, so three minutes, you start in each of the cell cycles, you produce this boundary. So these three minutes is much less than the Berg and Purcell limit. Uh, so the first thing we asked ourselves, can we actually reproduce this, the, the, these experimental results in terms of a molecular model. So we build a model where we have six binding sites for bicoid on the hunchback promoter, six because that's the known number of close by or proximal uh, uh, bicoid binding sites. So that basically it's known that at least those are certainly there. So we put in a model of six binding sites and we say, well, you can bind and unbind bicoid, and we can consider different models with when, when, how many do you need to be bound for um, 
expression to actually happen. Uh, and we assume that binding is diffusion limited, which uh, seems to be the case, that, 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 that that's the general uh, belief. So putting all this together with six binding sites, if we look at the probability of expression from this, uh, from this promoter as a function of the AP axis, uh, well, we basically see that in, in the time we have, uh, even if we had infinite time, which is the solid line, we cannot get as a, such a steep boundary as steep as from the data. So six Bickery binding sites is not enough. So we ask, could we get it with more? And the answer is yes. If we had, uh, if we had nine binding sites at least, the, then we could get. Okay, so maybe that's one solution, but this sort of started off a separate, more theoretical line of thought of asking, uh, well, is there a general link between all of these problems of variance or noise, steepness that we're saying and time? So of course, steepness of the border and also in a way, uh, precision of, of variance are quantities that, are, that we see as external observers. If you want to see a steep boundary, that means you have to take a step back and look at the embryo as a whole. A nucleus one nucleus in the in the embryo that does has no notion of, of steepness per se. Similarly for variance, this is an average over nuclei at a given position. So uh, but these are sort of observables that we do see the embryo embryo after embryo reproducibly manages to get as precise readouts or small variance, a steep border, and it manages to get it done in a finite amount of time. So how is that possible? And are these things generally related? So first of all, they are, and we can derive a very, you know, just doing simple algebra, we can derive a bound on steepness, which we can measure in terms of a hill coefficient. So basically the first derivative, uh, the tangent at, at the boundary. Uh, and we can see that the steepness is limited by the number of binding sites and the, di and the kinetics of binding and unbinding of the promote. And this shows you that if you want to get to, if you have six binding sites and you want to measure a steepness that you measure in experiments, which is actually, well, it's actually higher than six, but you know, possibly there are other uh, transcription factors, then uh, you, need, uh, you need to have very fast, uh, what, what we call activation time, which is basically the, the inverse of the rate with which you leave the, the state when all of the Bitcoin molecules are bound. So for simplicity, we could say that, well, the, the, the promoter is either off or it's on when all the six uh, binding sites are bound. And basically what this condition means is that you spend a lot of time in the off state and a lot of time in the off state, but you don't leave it, you know, you, you don't leave it easily. And in that, uh, sense, then you can get a steep boundary because basically you're, you're getting a cooperative effect of going between these two states. So you're getting a thresholding effect. Unfortunately, time comes into play because to get this steep boundary in steady state, so to be able to get a steady state measurement where you go often between these two st t st extreme states, you need a lot of time because to get to steady state, you need to sample. So time interferes with your steepness, but also steepness interferes uh, with, uh, with variance. So uh, again, if you, uh, if you want a steep uh, boundary, then you're going to play, uh, then, then you're gonna get high variance because again, you're spending a lot of time in the extreme states. So you don't have independent cycles. You don't have a lot of independent measurements and uh, your variance increases. And of course, time decreases variance because the more time you have, the more time you have to go through these samples and average. But there is a link. So at long time, you can get a, a large variance. However, large variance is always uh, linked, sorry, large steepness, but large, it's always linked to a larger variance than you would at the same time for a small variance. And at small time, well, you're not even gonna get your, your large steepness and uh, 
well, the plus side of that is that maybe you can save some variance. But there is a link to all of them. So again, we went back to the point of view that, well, this is great, but the, um, that's not what the nucleus actually cares about. So uh, taking it more from the point of the nucleus, we went to a measure which is, which is called positional resolution, which Peter Rhein uh, has used quite a bit and introduced. And the basic idea behind positional resolution is what is the minimal distance at which two, between two nuclei that can make a different measurement of, uh, uh, of the output. So basically how far apart can they be to measure different uh, quantities. And well, if you have a steep boundary, well, okay, if you don't have a steep uh, boundary, uh, sorry, how does it work? Then, then there's a problem because your outputs are going to be quite close to each other. Uh, the good news is then your variance is not going to be large, right? Because if you're not steep, then you can control your variance. Uh, but, you know, it's hard to get too close. If you're going to be, if you have a very steep input-output relation, then, uh, well, that's good because your outputs are going to be very far apart. However, your variance increases. So there's some in-between spot where you're steep enough, but not too, sweet, not too um, steep. So what we did is we varied the parameters of the problem, so the binding rates of the kinetic parameters to find the, for each length, for each nuclear cycle. So that means basically integration times, uh, uh, it, the cycles of where you integrate for different amount of time, we found the optimal steepness and the optimal positional resolution. So we vary all the parameters, we do an exploration. And so we find these and then we plot them as a function of cell cycle time. So we plot in, uh, in uh, blue the optimal steepness, so the, the, the hill coefficient, that's the dashed line here, with allowing for 2% variability, which is basically one nuclear size away, because you know maybe we're not optimal, we, we just want to get a feeling for it. And then uh, the corresponding positional resolution in orange. Uh, so here you have short cell cycles, and here you have long cell cycles. So at short cell cycles, you're not getting, your positional resolution is quite high, that meaning that Nuclei only far apart can tell, make different readouts, and here close by nuclei actually manage to get uh, uh, better readouts. Now, what these uh, the the interesting thing here really are the, the 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 dots or the squares and the circles, and this is experimental data. Uh, so you see that the positional we're sort of managing to get the right positional resolution, more or less. However, the hill coefficient, so the steepness of the curves that we're measuring in the data is actually much higher. So in the sense that you could say that, um, and, and, you know, and as I mentioned before, with six, promote, with six binding sites, you're never going to get the steepness you see in, in experimental data. Okay, but this is a simple model, so let us try a, a more complicated model, such as introduce non-equilibrium binding. So just for simplicity, we made three of the binding sites um, ha have non-equilibrium binding properties and three remained in equilibrium. And in this case, we are able to get hill coefficients that are larger, uh, that, that are of the right order uh, right order as the ones seen in the experiment, but it would, it, these ones are optimal for, for shorter cell cycles, which we could say, well, we don't care about that, maybe, maybe we're not optimal, but for, if we do get such high hill coefficients, a positional in, uh, resolution is still higher than seen in experiments. And the same thing uh, holds if we consider two mirror gradients that we can get higher hill coefficients, but the positional resolution is a bit borderline. But the main things you see here is also that we seem to, uh, you know, all of this uh, seems to happen at 
short cell cycles, whereas our data comes from longer cell cycles. So there's some disagreement here. So we did, we asked a last question, which is, well, we're so obsessed with the steepness, so why don't we just keep it fixed? Why don't we redo our optimization saying that now I want to have the right steepness, uh, I want to get the Hill coefficient I see in experiments, and how do I have to set my, uh, my uh, binding and unbinding parameters to get that? And it turns out that, and to get the positional resolution we also see in experiments. So that's the yellow line, and this is the, the, the uncertainty. And we see that we do get it if our binding, uh, if our binding uh, rate is an order of magnitude lower than we actually currently see in experiments. So basically, we, there's something that there's probably some sort of different binding going on. And one possibility is to have a different diffusion model. The other possibility is one that Eric invoked is that the concentration that the, the nuclei, the bicoid concentration, the nuclei, nuclei are actually sensing is different than the ones that is measured externally. Okay, I'll play you quickly Natalie's movie because I know it's entertaining and everybody loves the movie. So these are the sites of the of uh, expression. You actually see the mRNA being expressed uh, in the in the in the nuclei. And now I'll move uh, to the second part where uh, we sort of we looked more at the problem of uh, decision making in this system. So remember, uh, the Bug and Purcell estimate gives you 40 minutes. We're seeing a decision made in three minutes. If we, uh, if we ask how long does it take a nucleus to make a Bug and Purcell decision, assuming the probability of error of one sigma from the right concentration, you see that the, the time shoots up at the boundary, or put it another way, if you impose a time of 180 seconds, more than 30 nuclei uh, make an error. So that doesn't seem to add up. So we thought about different decision schemes than Bergen Purcell. So Bergen Purcell is a constant time decision step. You basically tell yourself, uh, I have time t to make a decision. I'm going to make measurements. I'm going to but you know, see how many times I get the binding and unbinding event, and based on that, I'm going to estimate uh, what is the concentration. You know, what's the, the con what is the concentration of my regulatory molecule? Given that in this time I made, I saw so many binding and binding unbinding events. So instead, what we said, well, what if now we don't keep time fixed and we just ask, uh, we just at every time point, we look at the log likelihood ratio of the probability of seeing a given distribution of on and on time, so bound and unbound times, given one concentration, uh, a high concentration, compared to a low concentration. So we're at the boundary and we're just asking, are you in the high or are you in the low concentration limit? You measure binding and unbinding over a trace, and uh, at each time, given the history of your trace, so given the number of on and off binding, you ask, am I more likely to be in a situation where my concentration of my regulatory molecule is high or I'm low? And so this log likelihood ratio defines a random walk in decision space. Every time you add information and you bias yourself more either to the decision that it's high concentration or to low concentration. And in the limit of it being a very hard problem and there being many binding and binding events, this is what a hard problem means, you can approximate this random walk in decision space as a diffusion problem. Well, you, you can approximate this, this pro process in, in, in decision space as a random walk in decision space, so a, a continuous uh, random uh, uh, sorry, continues this diffusion problem with some drift, your bias, and some diffusion 
describing the uncertainty. And then the problem of making a decision, so deciding that it's either the low or the high concentration, is basically the mean first passage time to reaching some prescribed error. So you say, I'm going to make my decision when I'm this certain, when my error falls below this rate, uh, and you ask what's the mean passage time of that. So uh, just to put some meat on this, because this is, is you know, a little bit abstract, if we have one receptor and we have a ligand binding and unbinding to it, we can write down the likelihood of uh, seeing a given number of bound states or when the receptor is on, simply like this at, the, at, at a certain time and the number uh, of off states. Of course, this is concentration dependent, this is independent, these are two exponential processes. So we can calculate the log likelihood ratio of the uh, on statistics and the off statistics given uh, the high concentration and given a low concentration. And we just compare it. So that's how you put it in. And but uh, what we want to do now is we want to generalize it to more complicated binding architectures and non exponential so that's what we did, um, and we I, we can solve the mean first passage problem. There's actually a lot of interesting things going on. The fact that it's a hard decision means we're in a limit where drift and diffusion balance each other. That's why diffusion no longer appears in this uh, ex equation explicitly. And we see that the mean decision time is inversely proportional to the deterministic bias. So basically, the stronger the bias, the faster you're going to make a decision. Uh, and what the bias is, is a cool black leibniz divergence between what you think is the, the distribution of on and off times and the, and the, and the real one. So you compare the, the two the distributions at on and off uh, of the low and high to the real one. And uh, you can rewrite it in terms of the cool black light with equations. Okay, but the stronger bias means you were better discriminating concentration, so faster decisions. So we can compare two architectures, one where you only turn on the gene when you actually produce from the promoter, uh, when you produce hunchback mRNA, when you have at least four binding sites bound, and compared to one when you only have two bound. And uh, the bias is larger when you have four bound, basically because it takes longer to go between the off and on state. So, so you're uh, stuck there. This is for fixed parameters. But now we can perform the, uh, an optimization procedure over all the parameters of the problem and ask what's the fastest decision time I can get uh, given that I want, I, uh, given different activation rules. So this is that I need all six binding sound sites bound to initiate transcription, five bound to initiate transcription, and so on. And you see that basically going below three minutes is not difficult in, in this case, whereas in Berg and Purcell, we're at 40 minutes. Regardless of what the parameters of the problem is, this procedure gives you a much, a lot of speed up in decision compared to the constant time integration of Bergen. And then you can say, okay, but what about steepness? So we can redo this in uh, finding a fastest architecture with as, assuming a steep boundary. And well, then it gets a little bit harder, but we still get a bunch of rules for which we safely under under the three minutes. And so what's the difference between uh, imposing steepness and not imposing? It's what we saw before. If you impose steepness, then you have to spend a lot of time in the two extreme cases states to basically get high cooperativity. So you need to make these excursions. If you don't, then you just, it's much easier to flip between on and off just by binding and unbinding one. So that's why it's easier to get but let's go to the realistic case with high steepness. And then um, you see that there's a lot of switching between on and off. And if you look at the medium time bound in, ex uh, uh, sorry, in, in the theory, you see that it's about half a second, although the mean is about seven seconds. And basically the t distribution of times bound has very long tails. And that's also what uh, Hernan saw in, in his experiments where he measured the mean for this binding time that is very similar to the theoretically predicting one. 
So it's basically the tails of the distribution of this distribution. So the rare events in, bind, in, in staying bound long uh, that help you make a decision. Okay, and the last thing is, so how can I achieve this? Uh, how can I uh, achieve this molecularly? So for that, we looked at the log likelihood, the contributions to the log likelihood ratio uh, to from the on times and the off times. And we ask, how can we reproduce that using uh, a, a molecular, uh, some sort of molecular model? So we basically ask, what kind of model do we need for our mRNA to behave this way? For our mRNA to decay when it's off, and to go up linearly when it's on, but with some delay. So that means we needed to have mRNA degradation and we needed to have inertia in the problem. So inertia is not hard because you need to assemble a binding site and then you maybe need to wait for polymerase to come. So there's some inertia in starting and there's also some inertia in finishing when you unbind because the polymerase is already progressing, it's on there, it's gonna finish. mRNA degradation is a bit more tricky because we don't really know whether mRNA is degraded, although in other systems, we do know it can be degraded, but it's clearly an element we need. But with these elements, we can build a simple molecular model where we reproduce exactly the calculation done by this log likelihood ratio. We get the desired steepness, precision, and time. So everything works. So just to show that this can be done by a biological model. So that's it. I basically wanted to show you that this is a process that happens very fast. The fact that it happens very fast does influence the molecular encoding of this process and it clearly restricts what is possible and what is not possible. It seems that bursty transcription and activation so that leads to long tails is important. And the steepness variance time actually work together to uh, put together a regulatory network. And if you don't restrict to constant time integration, you can get decisions that are much faster. So thank you. Thank you, Alessandra. That was, uh, that was wonderful. Um, any questions from the participants? So, um, Eric, yeah, go ahead. Thanks, that was very cool. So I got sort of lost in the last step where you were explaining how you can in implement the log likelihood um, physically. And so sort of the mRNA is doing it, but isn't the mRNA already supposed to be the readout? I mean, yeah, so that depends what you, uh, I, I mean, you know, the, 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 okay. I think it is a bit fuzzy about what is the decision and um, you, you know, and, and how is the decision made? So basically, the, if the ultimate decision is, uh, I mean, even if the ultimate decision is sulfate, the mRNA is, is the sort of, I mean, I think our vision was that the ultimate decision is somewhat sulfate or protein concentration and mRNA uh, is still a level when you can control things. That that was the but you know but I I agree that this is you know is mRNA concentration already uh, the decision or not? I mean we do know that mRNA concentration can be that mRNA is regulated and can be controlled. But you basically just need something that sort of counts up how many times this promoter has been bound yeah. and then goes when that count goes over. Yeah, so we need that, but, but right. So we need something that counts how many times the promoter goes on and off. But we also, we need erasure. I think that was why we turned to mRNA because, you know, I mean, this, this was the problem. I'm not gonna, you know, I mean, there's no point. We, we struggled with this. We need this. How are you gonna get that with a promoter alone? How are you gonna get the fact that when you're off, you're gonna erase the signal that you accumulated before? 
And our best guess at that was do it at the mRNA level. But this is, this is a suggestion. I mean, I'm definitely, okay. you know, this is clearly the thing that the reviewers forced us to think about. And we actually think it is cool to think about it, but it's a suggestion. I'm not gonna say this is the completely the right answer. It the just, it is not way. impossible for a biochemical system to produce a log likelihood that looks like that. That's all we're saying. It, we would have preferred had it happened at the promoter level, but I don't know how to kill promoter states. I think, okay, maybe Helena knows how to do it. I don't know, maybe we can have a question from Hernan. You also wanted to ask because you mentioned him and then afterwards we go to Peter Rehn. Uh, yeah, so yeah, I don't, I, I need to think more about this particular question actually. I don't, I don't quite, yeah. I, I don't know if I have an answer for you, Eric, either. Um, but I guess with the question I had, Alex, is the first part of the talk, it's like, and I, I've gone through this paper and I keep forgetting this detail, is the, um, it's all based on the fraction of active nuclei, right? How many spots you see. But then towards the end, in the second part, you showed something about the mean RNA levels. So I'm just curious about, like, maybe maybe I lost track of, of how how to connect the, the, not just the fr which nuclei are active, but what rate they're producing at. And maybe it doesn't matter because in your model, it, once you reach a threshold, you just produce. It actually doesn't matter. I mean, whether, you know, I mean, the, the actual values of whatever you measure, the steepness or so, I mean, the actual value will diff change a little bit. Yeah. But the yeah. fact that both of them are larger than six doesn't change and the, the precise value doesn't that, that doesn't change whether you look at mean intensity or whether you look at the fraction of spots Great. that are on. So like when we, you know, when we, in the experimental paper, we make a big deal about distinguishing the two. And mm -hmm. honestly, it's sometimes quite hard to wrap your head around, you know, which one is which. Uh, yeah. And I, I think, you know, I feel like killing Hui for giving them the same, essentially the same name, but for all like, <laughs> you know, cognitive purposes, they do the same thing. Got it. Cool, thank you. Peter Ren, you had a question? Yeah, I had a question about the role of non-equilibrium dynamics, but thinking about it, actually, it's maybe also related to um, the question of Eric. So could it not be um, that you um, exploit this idea that you need to assemble a number of factors before uh, transcription can actually start, right? So in these eukaryotic yeah. systems, you typically have to bring together a large number of factors. There's a lot of non-equilibrium dynamics in mm -hmm. there. So could you not imagine a scheme like kinetic proofreading? And kinetic proofreading is usually used to discriminate between different types of signals. But here, right, so the, the basic idea would be that you, 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 you exploit this idea of proofreading, that you drive yourself up a free energy landscape, but at each step, you have this process that also can bring you back all the way to the beginning, yeah. right? And only when you've made it to the final top, do you commit, right? And so would this not be... So, uh, so since you and I tend to possible? think alike, this is exactly what, how this project started. I basically had the intuition that non-equilibrium decision making will, you know, will help things. And then I wanted to put this into this framework. And, you know, that was the starting point. The non-equilibrium part doesn't seem to make the decision faster or better. It's like, it, it's, so it was, let's say, somewhat disappointing. So there's some SI figure about this. Mm. Uh, but, you know, you're right. Now, I don't, I mean, I don't know. It didn't, I, I still don't know how it would, you need to get rid of things. You really need to erase things. And I don't know how to erase things with kinetic proofreading. Like, you know, how would you, how would you erase a measurement that, that okay, let, let's say like, like Eric is saying, we limit ourselves to the promoter level. Yeah. You make a measurement, you know you're on, your promoter is on, it's saving that state, yeah. and somehow then it completely, it, it unbinds and it erases the fact that it's been long on for so long mm -hmm. linearly. So that means it's like the longer you're off, 
the sh shorter you remember having been on kind of thing. I don't know. Maybe you're right. Maybe I just need to think about it, but it, it's not obvious to me. Thanks. But the, what non-equilibrium things help is this inertial effect. Mm. And that's another, so in a way, you know, that we found that easy because that was easy to say, to, you know, you need to get inertia, you're going to get it through the, the hub binding and then non-equilibrium effects clearly help for making that inertia stable. Okay, thanks. Right. Yeah. I think we'll have to move on in principle, but there, if, if Stefan has a short question, uh, go ahead because uh, you, were, yeah. you also had your hand up. Yeah, just a short question. Beautiful. Um, and I was wondering, because what seems to slow it down is, of course, the transcription business that, you know, which always takes time. So I was wondering if you've thought about other developmental decision making, maybe where you're not quite, you know, have you looked, you know, maybe not going via transcription? You know, what's your thought there? Could, could it be a lot no, faster? Okay. So my, my, my very broad thought, especially since the question is coming from you, is that I'm really intrigued, and this is for what like Annie Kucheva talked about the first day, the integration of mechanical decision making and chemical, since you know that mechanics is much faster than, than chemical decision making. And I, I mean, I think this is really crucial. Here in this system, it's not an issue. The nuclei are not, you know, they're, they're not touching yet, right? But I think I mean, clearly in her system, this is a big thing and it'd be really interesting to sort of look at how decisions are made in that setting when you have this really fast decision and then short decision. All right. Thanks a lot, Alexandra, again. Our next speaker is uh, James 